Good morning. This is uh, Wednesday, uh, March 10th, 2021. This is Senate Judiciary. We're taking up S3 um, and accolating to um, competency to stand trial and insanity as a defense. You have before us a uh, redraft, draft 1.1 of the bill that has my name on it, um, but it really is a collaborative effort. Following um, hearing from um, the mother of a victim of a brutal uh, murder in Bennington, um, I contacted Erica Mathage and TJ Donovan and asked them to work together on an amendment. And at one point following that work, Sarah Robinson contacted me about another issue from the Network Against Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. And there is a, a, an amendment in draft 1.1 that's recommended by the network against domestic violence and sexual assault. So that's the genesis of it. Um, I'm gonna let uh, start off with Kelly uh, Carroll, who is um, uh, the mother of a uh, victim of murder in Bennington, who tell us a little bit about her experience. And this is really what led me to talk with Erica about some of what she has seen and she, Erica knew um, the alleged perpetrator of the crime um, uh, for quite a while and uh, has had, not knew him personally, but had a lot of contact with him. She'll explain some of the problems that she faced as a prosecutor in dealing with this man. And uh, uh, go ahead, Kelly. Welcome to Senate Judiciary. I'm obviously Dick Sears, your state senator, um, joined today by Philip Bruth, the uh, Vice Chair of the Committee. He represents Chittenden County. Uh, Alice Nitka, Clerk of the Committee, she represents Win Windsor County. Uh, Senator Joe Benning, longtime member of the committee from Caledonia County. And Senator White is not here right now. She's getting her COVID shot. Um, I guess there's a HIPAA violation for me telling you that on my TV. A lot of HIPAA anyway. violations these days. Yeah, yeah. So she will. Um, she will uh, be with us shortly, and I'm, I'm sure she can catch up on your testimony. So, thank you for joining us this morning, Kelly. And uh, again, um, my condolences for your loss. Unbelievable. Go ahead if you wanted to discuss. Oh, thank you, thank you. I hope you can hear me. Okay, um, I'm very nervous, so bear with me. Well, please okay. don't try to be as unnervous as possible. We're all. <laughs> Easier said than done. I know. Um, and of course, I there might be a time you want me to be nervous. Yeah. Representative Morrissey is also here. Yes, she's Kelly. been fantastic, um, yeah. as has, um, you know, Erica, State's Attorney Erica Marthage. And um, before I get started, and I hope everyone can hear me, uh, I want to take this opportunity to, to thank you, Senator Sears, and the rest of the Senate Judiciary Committee for allowing me to speak at this. I know that... Um, this is an opportunity. It's, you know, um, and uh, I know you don't like to probably talk to people like me, um, but I want to thank you for that. Um, and I want to thank Peggy because she's been very, very helpful with all of my questions. Um, before I start, I just I want to let you know that my camera's on my laptop, but I've got a bigger screen over here. So if I look to the side, I, I'm not trying to be rude. Please no don't take it that way. Um, hmm. But I'm a really private person, and, and these last seven weeks have been extremely difficult. Um, and I know Peggy sent me the agenda, and the agenda said concerned citizen next to my name. And I guess that's that's true, but I think here today I'm, I'm more as a, a, here as a grieving mother. I'm, I'm a consequence of the actions of our laws and the ability of people like Darren Pronto to get away with first degree premeditated murder without consequence. There's several disconnects between public safety and mental health. And I just wanna make it perfectly clear from the get go, I am under no way, under no circumstances advocating for taking anyone's rights away or you know, locking people up unnecessarily. But it's my understanding that there are top 10 or 12 um, most violent offenses. I'm not an attorney, I don't pretend to be. 
I've learned a lot. I have a lot to learn. Um, and, and I think basically, you know, for me, my opportunity is to tell you what happened to my daughter. Um, some of the frustrations with the disconnects. Um, and then, you know, I, maybe part of the solution, uh, you know, I, I'm not really sure, but I'm sorry. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with the case, my daughter was 26 years old. She was walking through downtown Bennington at 1115 on a Monday morning. It was Martin Luther King's day. She was on the river walk in the uh, Bank of Bennington area and the Bank of Bennington was closed that day because it was the holiday. There was a visiting nurse that was inside of the Willumsack Park um, Apartments, which is a senior housing complex that backs up to the Bank of Bennington and the local VFW, which hopefully gets open because that's a really important part of that community. Um, and in that area, there was um, a woman that was doing a home health nurse. She was a nurse, she is a nurse, and she came out of that apartment building on the side and saw Darren Pronto hovering in the, the trees in there and she got scared. She didn't wanna walk down the walkway. So instead she walked down the grass, the snowy grass into the Bank of Bennington parking lot and sat in her car and called her parents because she was scared. Her parents said, call 911. So she called 911. And while she was on the phone with 911, my daughter came walking up the path. My 120 pound, five foot two petite daughter came walking up the path. And Darren Pronto, who I have no idea who he was before this, um, he's a good sized guy. He's about 5'10, 5 5'11, 5 couple hundred pounds, stands up, was competent enough to pull up his baggy pants, ran up behind her, tackled her, slit her throat, got up ran away and was captured a couple hundred yards from the scene, covered in her blood with the bloody knife. One of the Bennington police officers um, was responding to the nurse's 911 call. So he was right there and just happened to be in the right space at the right time. There were two video surveillance cameras. There ended up being a second witness. There was a third camera with still photos and he's gonna get away with premeditated first degree murder because there is a disconnect in the law. So like I said, I'm not a lawyer. I don't really understand all the details, but in my little layperson mind, mm -hmm. it's my understanding that someone can go um, and commit a violent first degree premeditated murder crime and his defense attorney gets to shop around for one non-competent finding before we go to court, which is why they denied um, the request to have a bail hearing and what's going right to an evidentiary hearing. So he goes and he shops around and he gets one not competent finding, not like a board of anything. You know, I mean, I think that that's something that really needs to be considered. And I know S3 has the forensic working group and I would very, very much love to be a part of that. I know that I'm probably not qualified for it, but I would really love to participate and be part of the solution. Um, but anyway, so he goes in, he gets this one not competent finding and it can be anybody. He can just go right online and he can look, you know, like I can go online and I can find the same doctor to find me um, to certify my ostrich as a service animal. But um, that doesn't mean the TSA and the airlines are gonna let me take it on the plane. You know, so just because one person says that somebody is not competent doesn't mean that they should be able to get away with first degree murder. And that's what happens. They get that before they go to the evidentiary hearing. The person goes into the custody of the Department of Mental Health. Department of Mental Health medicates, does whatever they do. And then when they feel like they're done with them, out the door he goes with no supervision and no follow up. And I can say this because I know it happened in Pronto's case. Now he's been in the system twice before in the state systems. And you're not gonna find that in the medical records. You can't because of HIPAA. And I'm all about HIPAA. I have a healthcare background. I work in healthcare. Um, and I get the whole importance of, of HIPAA and everything like that. But this is a disconnect with public safety and this is serious. And I can't find out why he was in the mental hospital the second time. And I can't find out you know, exactly when he got out and, and all of that stuff because it's a, he's protected. But I'm gonna tell you something, I found out because I found the victims. I found the other victims from the last time. So about two years ago, he had um, problems with a neighbor. One of the neighbors complained. He thought it was a different neighbor and he went and he terrorized those people. He went, he actually broke in, threatened to slit their throats, kill their children, except the cops got there and saved them. 
and he went into the system and he got released with no follow up. There's no violent, there's no um, involuntary medical medication order. You know, it's my understanding that they can, there is some medication. Again, I'm not a professional, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a doctor, I don't pretend to be. Um, but if there's something that can protect the public, I really think that public safety has to take, it has to have some priority in the system. You know, I, I don't, I don't understand how he can, he can do this. And I'll tell you something, when you go through something like I'm going through and my family's going through, yes, you get a lot of love and support from the community, but you also find out a lot of things that you didn't really know. And, um, Pronto made a video, um, they posted it on Facebook in November of 2020. So this was two months before he murdered my daughter. And he went ranting and raving and bragging about how he's a murderer, he can get away with it. He was laughing at our police officers. He was laughing at all of you guys because of the laws. He, you know, it, our laws have enabled him, they have empowered him. He has gone around being, he has terrorized the community. He's a domestic terrorist. He may not be political, but he's a domestic terrorist. And he has been empowered by the loopholes in the laws that the defense attorneys are capitalizing on. And it really needs to be corrected before you've got another person like me begging you to fix the disconnects. And again, I am not advocating for anybody's rights to be taken away. But when you're talking about those top 10 or 12 violent crimes, there has to be something to protect the, the public. And if this person goes into the custody of Department of Mental Health, there has to be something to protect the public when he comes out. There should be a notification to the victim, there should be a notification to the state's attorney, and there should be some kind of a notification to the public. And I know that that's a very hot topic with HIPAA, but mm -hmm. you have to look at public safety. I had no idea who Darren Pronto was before all of this. And I'm gonna challenge each of you to research him and see what he's done because he's laughed at all of us. He laughs at our law enforcement, he laughs at our laws and he gets away with it. And when he gets out this time, which he will, because it's my understanding any of these changes are not gonna impact him because he'll be grandfathered under whatever else was out there. And when he gets out, I guarantee you there will be more blood. There will be more violence, there will be more victims, there will be more bloodshed, and that's because our laws have enabled him and empowered him. And all of our legislatures have to our legislators have to take responsibility for that. I do not know all the processes, but from my understanding, this S3 needs to get through committee, it needs to get through the floor, and then it's got to get through whatever crossover is. Um, like I said, I have a lot to learn. Um, and then I realized it's gonna be an uphill battle in the Senate. I know it was last year. Um, and the only thing I can tell you is that um, Emily's dead. I can't, I can't bring her back, but I can be her voice and I am gonna be her voice and I am gonna continue to be her voice on this issue because I don't consider myself a stupid person. Um, probably a lot of people disagree with that, but I do um, now consider myself uninformed. And I'm willing to bet that there are a lot of Vermonters out there like me that don't realize that we have these disconnects and don't realize how much of a danger to public safety this is gonna be. And when he gets out, where's he gonna live? Do you think he's gonna come back to Bennington County? Or do you think maybe he's gonna go up north? Maybe he'll go to Chittenden County. Maybe he'll go up to the Northeast Kingdom. Maybe he'll go to, and stay in Springfield. Maybe he'll come back to, to Southwest Vermont. Um, but I gotta tell you, wherever he goes, he's gonna continue to terrorize because he can. We've allowed it. And it's just something that we need to change. So, you know, um, I have a lot to learn. I, I've learned a lot. Um, I've tried learning about S3. Um, the whole thing is, is, is kind of overwhelming. Um, when we were notified of Emily's murder, uh, BPD and the state's attorney's office were, were both fabulous, in the circumstances, I mean, what can you do? Except right from the get-go, we were being primed for no jail time. No jail time. This is gonna be like the Elizabeth Teague case because of the laws, you know? And I know that you all know about the Elizabeth Teague case, so I don't need to go into that. Um, but, it, you know, it, it shouldn't be right. It, it sh He shouldn't be allowed to just get out and, and come out and terrorize. And you're empowering other people like him you know, it, and he may, he, I do not know him. And if there is a, you know, justified mental illness, 
you know, what's, why are there so many other people out in our community that are productive, active, you know, participants in our community? They don't go around planning his murder or, or murders. And he planned this. He, um, about four days beforehand, carved murder time into his dining room table or wall or something like that. Nobody called the police. For months, he was terrorizing and threatening his neighbors throughout the fall and early winter of 20, fall of 20, early winter of 2021. They called the state police multiple times. Two of his neighbors had to get stalking orders, all of it because he was threatening to slit their throats and nothing happened. The state police, there were at least four calls that Olivia and Jake made, two of which were responded to, two of which weren't. I haven't spoken with the other neighbors. The victim from a couple of years ago where he got out, I have a call with this afternoon. Um, this just, you can't, you can't keep allowing it. You have the ability to keep us safe. You, you took an oath when you were, in, you were elected. Your constituents expect it. Um, and I'm gonna do my best to be part of the solution. You know, I'm part of, I've asked to join the opioid response team in, in, um, in town. I'm part of a small group um, organizing a community walk. And our first one is Saturday, March 20th at 10 a.m. at the Wollumsack Apartments, which is where the crime happened. It's not a political walk. Um, it's geared towards bringing peace and um, some security back to the residents of, of that community. Um, those, those elderly seniors in the Wollumsack Apartments are terrified to come out of their house because of this. And again, we've empowered people like Pronto, and 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 we need to change it. Um, I know I'm babbling, and I do apologize, but you know I, I have some questions. I, I want to know why he has more rights to terrorize our community than than we have the right to public safety. I want to know why our laws allow DM DMH to release anybody at any time without notifying anybody and and protecting the community. Um, do you want Pronto in your community? Because I don't want him back this way in mine. He's not required to medicate when he comes out. And, and I'll tell you, we've got a lot. I, I am not, you know, one who reads all the newspapers. But if you look in the past couple of months, we've had a large increase in violence in Vermont. Up in Burlington, there's been two incidences with involving guns and, and significant domestic violence and drugs. And Pronto's involves drugs. So I guess, you know, one, one question is, if you take somebody who is out of their mind on crack and they commit a violent crime and we put them away with DMH and we eventually dismiss charges because when they go into the custody of DMH, that's the normal practice, charges gets dismissed. Why is that different than somebody, you know, that, that goes in and drinks too much and, and commits vehicular manslaughter? It's not. I mean, it probably is in the sense of the, the legal terms and everything, but if you're gonna allow somebody to take a lot of crack cocaine and then go out and kill somebody and then say, oh, I'm not competent, you know, what do, as a society, we're headed down a really, really bad path because we all know that there's a significant addi addiction problem in Vermont. And this adds to this problem. And the more that we allow people like Pronto to use this non-competent get out of jail free card, the more we're gonna have this problem. So um, I, I think that's, that's you know, pretty much you know, what I wanted to say. And you know, basically I'm a nobody, I'm not a law enforcement officer. I'm not a mental health professional. Um, I'm just a, a registered independent who says that public safety is a bipartisan um, issue. And, and you, need, you need to correct that before there's more bloodshed because that bloodshed is going to be on everybody's hands for not addressing it. You know, you sit, you're, you're all elected for a purpose. You hear, you hear the problems you see the problems, but I live the problems. My family lives the problems. Her friends live the problems. Our communities live the problems. There are people in Pownal that are petrified he's gonna get out and he's going to, and we need to fix it. So that's all I wanted to say. Um, I really wanna thank you for your time, um, for the opportunity to, to speak. And I, I pray that this, makes its way through crossover or, or whatever the policy is. And, um, 
Should this make it to the um, House Judiciary Committee, I would welcome the opportunity to, to speak at that. I would welcome the opportunity to speak on um, any, any other pertinent issues regarding addiction, um, criminal justice reform, um, mental health services in Southwest Vermont, especially Bennington County. I wanna be part of the solution and I do thank you and I will shut up now. Kelly, thank you thank very you much. much. Um, Senator, Senator White, White. From, oh God, I've got his problem again. Senator White has joined us from Wyndham County and uh, Senator White was one of the sponsors of S3 along with Senator Lyons who chairs the Health and Welfare Committee and Senator Clarkson from Windsor County who's also a, a, a the, I've got a, a different route. Um, and uh, Senator um, Clarkson is the uh, Senate Majority Leader. Um, we're, we passed this bill last year and it sat in the House. Actually, we, I think we passed it in 2018 before COVID hit and it sat in the House and never got dealt mm -hmm. with. So we're hopeful that next year, it, the, the start is this bill, but also the forensic working group, as you noted, because Vermont is unlike many states without a forensic unit um, that's available to uh, the Department of Mental Health. Um, I don't know if there's any questions for you. I, you know, we did converse back and forth by email. I had not met you before, but mm -hmm. I really appreciate your um, taking the time with us, but also your advocacy. Uh, and I, one of the things that struck me in your advocacy is that you stated in one of the emails that you and I traded back and forth that it sort of really wasn't about your daughter. You just wanted to make sure nobody else had to go through what you were going through. And I thought that was really a, um, you know, a very um, courageous thing for you to say. And I know you've also got grandchildren here who have been impacted by this. And, uh, you didn't mention that. Uh, so I think the committee needs to know that um, your daughter also had two children, is that correct? One. Yeah, she has a, um, an 18, he just turned 18 months. Okay. 18 He's in months. foster care. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. I think that um, it's important, those things to note. Um, and, you know, we're still a small state. And, um, you know, when your letter came, and the background of Mr. Pronto, uh, I contacted Erica, who's our next witness. And Erica laid out quite a long history with this man. And uh, I think part of it is when you don't deal with problems, um, they get bigger and bigger. Um, mm -hmm. I've always likened this to, um, I used to run 204 Depot on Ron Depot Street. Yeah. And when we had a couch with a little bit of a hole, if we didn't fix the little hole, the kids would seem to enjoy making it bigger and bigger. And finally, you had to replace the whole couch. Um, and I, if you don't take care of the little things, sometimes the big things will get you. Right? I think there's a history here of not addressing his mental illness and his um, violent uh, behavior and his threats and other behaviors. So I think... Uh, are there any other questions for Kelly before we go to Erica Mathage? Thanks again, Kelly. We really yeah, appreciate I, your testimony. I, and, uh, I do want to thank you, and, and I do appreciate it. And I, um, I'm a realist, and I don't expect that this is going to get passed um, this year. And um, I just want you to know that it is my goal to be part of the solution, and I will be um, advocating for the education of the everyday Vermonter on the... Um, disconnects until we can get it um, through the house. So yeah, anyway, I'm, well, I'm, I'm going to hang on and listen if you don't mind. I would like no, to hear no, that. Absolutely not. And uh, I would say we're determined to get this through the Senate this year, and hopefully the House will take it up. Um, I think there's enough I would like your I would like you all to commit to that personally. Um, I know that puts you all on the spot. I, but I would like I'm you to have I would like you to commit to asking that. Yeah, I've got a dog in the background, obviously, who's excited. Um, but um, 
I can't commit to what the House does. I can't. Oh, I know. I know. Out of Senate. And that's where Representative Morrissey comes in and some other mm -hmm. folks, uh, can yeah. run herd over the House. Yeah. Thank so, you. Thank um, you. Thank Erica, you. Uh, I'm going to go shut the dog up, but if you could start, <laughs> and I'll be right back. Hey. And uh, I apologize for being late. I had my second shot this morning Yay. and I just, yeah, just got, <laughs> just got back. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, so you've just heard from um, Kelly Carroll about the, the severe uh, deficiencies uh, in our response as a state to individuals that have the intersection of criminality and mental illness. Uh, this is not new. Um, it's been uh, an extremely frustrating issue for anyone that's been in law enforcement. I'm sure it's also uh, a frustrating issue for uh, the individuals in, uh, that work in DMH as well. Uh, it's what do we do with the individuals that uh, have a mental illness but have also broken the law? Um, so I think S3 is a good start. Uh, I just want to run through some of the things that Kelly testified to and how some of the changes in S3 will address those issues. Um, the first being the uh, notification issue. Uh, the, the way it is now, C, um, I think it's C1 in the bill, uh, in, the, in the law, only requires notification for specific uh, types of orders. And then some case law in Ray DC narrowed that even more. So it's really only that we get notification of these orders uh, of someone being discharged if it's within the first 90 days of an order. So a couple of problems with that. The, when they're released on day 91 from a hospitalization, we don't get notification when they're released on, um, when their ONH, their order of non-hospitalization lapses, uh, we're not notified about that. And frankly, you know, 90 days for purposes of an order of non-hospitalization is a drop in the bucket. That's like maybe barely long enough to get uh, an initial appointment or some initial contacts and uh, services set up for an individual. So. S3 uh, changes that and adds uh, C2, um, and that requires notification. And uh, this is a good, this is a healthy start, right? So Ms. Carroll uh, mentioned Elizabeth Teague, and anybody who remembers that case knows it's, you know, 30 years later. So we used to get, when I first took office, I can tell you like the second phone call I got when I sat in that chair was from the Department of Mental Health asking me if I would agree to not fight releasing Elizabeth Teague. And I got that call every year. And Ira Morris, it was like a little inside joke. He would call me every year. What do you think this year? How about this year? And every year I would say, no, because <laughs> her competency was not restored. So that meant I couldn't prosecute her I couldn't get her on any kind of supervision. And I had no information about why. I was not entitled to get any of her records indicating that she was in any way any better. The last hearing we had in that case was probably, uh, was right before actually the law changed, uh, which made it impossible. Then I didn't have to, I didn't get notification anymore. They didn't need my permission. The last hearing we had, DMH made a motion to put her in a step down placement I put on the full case, all the history, she represented herself. And I can tell you that 25 years later, she was still fixated on the same people. She was talking about the same situation that led to the homicide that she committed in Bennington in the, early, in the late 80s. So to me, someone that's been in a facility for you know, 25 to 30 years and is still talking about the people that she believed were conspiring against her and what caused her led her to commit that murder in the first place, that's the information that the state's attorneys should have because we are the keepers of public safety, not the Department of Mental Health. And I don't say that like as a backhanded insult. 
It's just not. <laughs> the way the law is written, that is not their responsibility. It's not the lens that they're looking at these cases through. They are looking at how do we treat the person? What is the best thing we can do for this person? And that's what they should do. The mistake that we made as a state and then exacerbated it about five years ago was when we made it so that the people who are in charge of public safety are shut out. We're completely left out of the room when it comes to those negotiations. So we can't have conversations with the individual mental health uh, treatment providers. We don't even get reports. We don't get uh, any information. Um, and C3, uh, I'm sorry, C2 in that bill at least begins that process where now we're gonna go back to, we need to be notified. When someone has been charged with a crime and they are found not competent, and so the crime is essentially dismissed, we definitely need to know when they are now deemed to have a return to competency. And so what that helps us with is, A, we can notify victims. I, um, in this case, in the Pronto case, one of the emails that I found was from one of his prior assaults where uh, the one that Ms. Carroll spoke about was the victim contacting my victim advocate and pleading to know where is he now? Is he being released? And the response I got from attorney Morris at that time was, I can't tell you. And that's not okay. <laughs> that's not an appropriate answer. So I think C, uh, C1 is the way it currently is. Of course, that was curtailed by that Supreme Court case. But then C2 uh, is the language that will expand that. So now we'll receive notification. Um, and on notification, it should not be tied to offense. I know Ms. Carroll uh, spoke of um, the offense that he had been, you know, that certain offenses or someone's charged with a certain offense. We never know, right, which it's really not offense driven. And, and a lot of the other institutions are moving away from that. We're moving away from that in the juvenile world. It's not offense driven. It's dangerousness driven. We should be looking at a risk needs responsivity. That's what we should be looking at. What does this person need? What is their level of dangerousness? And how do we protect the public without locking them up if it's not necessary? I mean, if it's an individual that um, can and wants to be part of an ONH, then they should be given that opportunity if that's what the Department of Mental Health and the treatment team is uh, recommending. But the issue with the ONHs as they stand now, we have no idea if they comply or not. Uh, A, because of the notification, but B, the ONHs get ordered, they're 90 days long. We have no clue if they're complying or connected to services or have supports in place. Uh, the only reason I find any of those things out is if I have a pending case and I just tell the defense attorney, look, get me anything that says this person is engaged in treatment. We had one yesterday uh, on a calendar call where a vet who suffers seriously with PTSD uh, co committed a DUI. Okay, uh, it's DUI. Um, I only need to worry about public safety as far in as far as if I think he has um, access to a vehicle and is gonna drink. But the reality was the conversation I had with the defense attorney was all around his treatment. You know, is he engaged at the VA? He's become so, he's actively engaged. What I need to know is if I'm gonna say this person was not competent or they were insane at the time of the offense, I need some reassurance that I'm gonna to be told whether they're actually complying with those orders or not. And I think that the final section of the, and I wrote it down, the, uh, that's C3. So C3 in that uh, 48, section 4822 is what provides the uh, basis for treatment providers. And typically it's the designated agency. And what's frustrating with some of the cases like Pronto was he was repeatedly on, and this was in my email to Senator Sears, Pronto was repeatedly on various conditions requiring him to engage in mental health treatment. 
he had a history going back, you know, eight years where competency had not become had not come up as an issue. But I and but I recognized that clearly it seemed like something was an issue with him with his mental health. So we sent I sent him to our treatment diversion. Just get your mental health treatment. I sent he ended up on probation. His only conditions were engage in mental health treatment. He commits another offense. And then that's when his attorney starts arguing he's not competent. He had been up to that point assumed competent. There had not been a report. The defense had not requested one. So that just highlights how even here in Pronto, we were aware of the mental health issues he was having. But every single time, and he was in court probably four or five separate times where the court ordered, you need to comply with mental health conditions. Go to your designated agency, connect with them, take any you know required prescriptions. And those were things that uh, he was not doing. So I understand we went around and around with this, uh, you know, David and Pepper and TJ and I on the phone with what do we well, what do we do with the individuals that are on an ONH? Uh, the language in C3 says, okay, now the court and the state's attorney need to be notified if they're not complying with the ONH. Well, now what? Well, the now what is we reassess whether they should continue to be on an ONH because remember when the court's ordering an ONH, the court is assuming that the person is going to follow these conditions and comply with them. So if they are not, we need to reassess whether they are an appropriate person for an ONH. Um, the frustration that I think all state's attorneys have uh, and police, it's absolutely true and accurate. We, I have multiple body cameras where the defendant is yelling at the police officer, you can't do anything to me, I'm not competent. Um, I don't know why you're wasting your time. Uh, it's frustrating. And, and the reason is, is because DMA, it's like a one-way street. They, they have uh, an individual that comes into the DMH system from crimin criminal system, and we don't know anything after that until they make their way around and we end up with them again. <laughs> and, uh, and this is something also that I would challenge everybody to look at. Uh, look at your own county and try to, try to determine if your, or ask your state's attorneys, how many of your officer involved shootings involve people with significant mental illness? In Bennington, it's all of them. And that's not okay either. <laughs> so um, to have a mentally ill person uh, in some type of crisis that we've dealt with repeatedly get shot, that's not okay either. So I think that S3 is a good start. I think ultimately I would love to see um, a forensic board. Uh, I completely agree with uh, Kelly on that. I don't know if she researched it. Uh, I have spoken with some folks in mental health, uh, the mental health field about the like the structure they use in Connecticut, which would be phenomenal, but it's uh, it's not necessarily expensive. <laughs> it's it's just making sure you have a panel or a board of people sitting at the same table, really case staffing, just like we do with all of our other, like what I do a lot of with youth. What is it that this person needs? Where do they need to be? How do we balance that public safety concern with the individual rights of the person? Because someone that's mentally ill, the criminal justice system, the purpose of the criminal justice system changes. It's not about uh, making reparations or um, you know punishment, or it's really about what do we do to keep this person from being involved in this system and harming other people and taking someone's life like Emily. So um, if I, anybody has any questions, but I think I hit kind of, the only thing I didn't touch on because I think it makes more sense for David to address is the, the um, AAG or, you know, an AAG not representing DMH. Uh, I think that the language about the state being able to get its own evaluation is obviously super important. We were completely shut down when, when that last Supreme Court case came out that said, 
we can't get an independent evaluation. That's the other thing that Kelly's absolutely correct about. Um, I have not heard anything from Pronto's defense attorney about competency. He did not ask for uh, a court evaluation because one of the last court evaluations we had on him said that he was competent. So, and then I would have something to base my argument on. The way it stands now, I'm not gonna have anything. He's gonna get an, he's gonna get an expert. Um, if he doesn't like that expert's finding, remember he doesn't need to tell me. It's not the requirement of the state. If I get an expert and they say he's not competent, I have to share that. Um, so, but that doesn't, it doesn't operate that way with the defense attorney. So he can get it, he can shop until he finds one that has the opinion he wants and I can't do anything about it. So I think that, I think that um, S3 fixes that too, so. Thank you, um, Eric. I don't know if there's questions, but I wanna point out while we're having this discussion, the huge majority, and I don't know what the percentage is, of folks suffering from mental illness are not in the criminal justice system. They're people right. who are ill, like any other illness. We all believe that. Um, we are talking about a small, luckily small subgroup of individuals who are suffering from mental illness who are a danger to themselves or others, a significant danger to other people. Right. They have victims. They have committed offenses, which if they were not mentally ill would be um, very serious offenses, such as this murder um, that we just heard about. But also, I mean, there are, I, I just don't want people to lose sight of the fact that we are not here kind of um, condemning the mental health system or our Department of Mental Health. They do an outstanding job with most people. There are folks who are dangerous, who are um, incompetent to either stand trial or incompetent to, uh, found to be in, not guilty by reason of insanity. That does not mean that the offense didn't happen and that, they not, that hopefully they will not continue to be a danger. But one of the things that I saw in the um, emails that you wrote to me that um, uh, regarding Pronto case is that there was an issue of medication, am I correct? And my, my recollection was that he did fairly well when on medication, but um, once again, the issue was, was once he left the department, um, he was uh, off the medication and self-medicating with um, other drugs uh, and that contributed to um, his continued violent um, behavior. Is that correct? It, it is correct. And so the, that um, one of the issues that I saw with him, and it happens a lot, is the family members are the ones that end up calling me just because I had had contact with them previously on that case, or uh, I would have one... Um, in this case, in the Pronto case, his sister had called, uh, not me, but she had called law enforcement when he was uh, going through the issues with the neighbors and threatening them. And um, he, she told the neighbors, you know, he's not on his medication. And so that's part of what I think the work group would be able to look at is what is right now, I think it's really differing. So in Bennington, we have the United Counseling Services. Uh, they're our designated agency. However, if I have anybody that's in say Manchester or mm -hmm. North um, Dorset, uh, any of the areas up, I send them to, uh, I had a man in Rupert who had been at Second Spring, he'd been hospitalized. His mother would call me regularly, at least once a week and tell me how he was doing. Uh, he actually wrote to me from Second Spring a number of times um, and it, not in like an awful way because I get those letters all the time, but like just saying how things are going. Um, his mom moved to Rutland Mental Health because he was great when he took his medication, but she was a small woman and he, was, he had actually been injured when he was uh, logging. So he had TBI and then he had uh, um, schizophrenia that was onset when he was in his late 20s. 
if he, she called Rutland Mental Health when he was a patient, she moved him there to be a patient. They all she had to do was say, I'm calling, I'm calling your caseworker, because what they would do is send out a team. Two people would then come to the house, convince him to take his medication. If you don't, you're going to have to come with us. And he would always take it. She said that happened once where they had to have the, the individuals come to the house. And, and then every time after that, it was just, she would say, uh, you know, if you don't take it, John, I'm going to have to call. And, and it made it, it, it made it so that she could manage him. Um, now I know that's not going to be the case in every case, because there's all varying levels of mental illness. What I think is missing in Vermont is the collaboration between DMH and the, the, the agencies that are responsible for public safety. I, I'm fine with it not being me, but <laughs> let's have, you know, it doesn't have to be a state's attorney. It could be uh, like this forensic group that like what they use in Connecticut, where there's a panel of individuals that are really case working each individual. Because again, the criminal justice system is not, we can't just we are a small state. We shouldn't be trying to treat everyone with broad sweeping strokes. We should be looking at each individual case. What is their, what are their needs? What is their risk? And then trying to figure out how we can best monitor them without curtailing their individual freedom, but to keep the public safe. Because the way it is now, we're not protecting the public. I appreciate that. Um, I think that's... Uh... So even as with so many other things, we don't have uniformity in the designated agencies and how they respond to various uh, crises. And, and that might be part of the study here. Um, to look at the variances in the different um, designated agencies. Or any, you know, it's probably a better way to put it than I just gave you. <laughs> um, uh, going to back to my agenda, my agenda is all messed up. Um, are, are there other questions for Erica from anybody on the committee? Erica, thanks so much for your willingness to work with TJ and uh, the state and Pepper and, uh, and others um, to uh, put some changes to S3 that you feel would would help, situ help avoid perhaps avoid situations, but your emphasis on the forensic works is the right place. We need to change. Sure. And I thank you very much. All that. You're welcome. Have a nice uh, day, everybody. Well, I've got David Shearer scheduled next, or but do you and Pepper want to try to do a tag team here on us? Or you, you basically have rewritten um, S3. Um, and I because I'm, uh, I'm able to, I put my name on the amendment, but it's really the, your amendment. Thank you, Senator. Yeah. Because obviously we can't put your names on. I, I want to explain that since we're live and that didn't come out right. We can't put a non-Senator's name on an amendment. It has to be one member of the Senate or the entire committee or whatever. So. My name is on the amendment, but you, you and Pepper actually, along with Erica, drafted the amendment. So. Senator White. My apologies for uh, coming in late, but so we're we're not looking at S three as it was introduced. We're looking at a rewrite. Drafts, yeah, draft one point one of S three. Okay, I have to go down and print it out because I don't, I didn't see that uh Sorry. i think we can put it on the screen if you want no that's okay that would I be can, easier um, unless other people want that i can the, i down think and print it. There, much of it is the same as s3 as introduced it is not huge changes that um but it, it does address some of the things that kelly and Erica spoke about, and I violated your HIPAA rights by telling people you were getting your COVID shot, by the way. Oh, no, that's okay. That's okay. I just told them to. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just, um, I, I thought when you said that they rewrote S3, I figured that it was a well, whole different. It, it is a strike ball, but it, it contained much of what, you know. This, okay. 
I'll All let right. them kind of go through it, and then we can hear from uh, the Department of Mental Health and Yakima College. Okay. And, uh, well, and after we hear from Karen Barber, which is one little yep. part of it. Okay, thanks. Okay. Yep. All right, maybe what you can do is start with whatever you want to do. Eric, did you want to kind of, what do you want? Well, Senator Sears, I just wanted to ask if, it, would you want me to put the document up on the screen while, while uh, David and- I think it might be easier for everybody to know what's changed, what's the same, and the changes right. that they made. Okay. Um, I can easily do that. And, and as you walk through it, David and, and James, just let me know when you want me to page down or whatever, whatever works. Okay. Why don't we do it that way then? <laughs> Does everyone see the bill now? Yep. Yeah, okay. we're starting. Um, it's a strike off um, and pages. Until you get to page three, there's no change. Am I correct? That's right, Senator Sears. So maybe, David, you can explain why you took the Attorney General out of. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. For the record, David Chair with the Attorney General's office. Uh, we've been, and just for the record, also the Attorney General certainly supports uh, the amendments that have been put forward, and which will be, uh, which State Attorney Martha's already discussed a bit, and we'll discuss a little more in a moment. Um, I want to make clear that I, I did the conversation that I had was with both State Attorney Martha's and, and T.J. Donovan, the Attorney General, and they volunteered to work together to develop this. You're presenting. That's right. Thank you, Senator. And, and the Attorney General was personally involved in uh, discussing some of these amendments. Uh, I should note that the one we're just about to discuss is not particularly substantive by comparison to the other issues that we're discussing later in the bill. This is really more of a technical issue, a procedural issue, whereby the Attorney General's office could face conflicts with itself, essentially, in instances where it would be asked to represent the Department of Mental Health and also uh, be prosecuting a case through its criminal division. And to avoid that, we wanted to take out the statutory mandate that we be involved in these uh, cases, you know, that we'd be involved in representing the Department of Mental Health. Uh, that doesn't mean that it wouldn't happen. Uh, it does mean that we will continue to be involved in discussions with the department about how to uh, make sure that the department does in fact have the representation it needs in cases. I know that those discussions are ongoing and we believe we can solve, resolve that issue administratively, but in order to avoid uh, sort of forcing the AG's office into a position of uh, conflict with itself and, and potentially having issues with uh, issues of ethical responsibility from um, the professional ethics rules, uh, we would ask that this provision be taken out and we will continue to work with the department to figure out the issue of representation. Again, that's not uh, particularly substantive with respect to the underlying really serious issues we're discussing in the bill. Um, unless there are any questions, we can keep scrolling down. We're on to page five. Uh, page five. This break out a whole bunch of stuff. That, that's right. I mean, it, it, it's a lot of text. I wouldn't say uh, it's really captured by one simple idea, which is that the notice provisions are no longer going to be limited by crime type. And State's Attorney Martha already discussed why this is an important change. We really need to be looking at issues of risk, uh, not categorizing things solely by crime type. This is a change we're actually seeing all throughout our criminal codes and juvenile uh, approach to juvenile justice as well, where we really need to be looking at what are what's the risk presented, what needs do people have in terms of being served. And um, the crime type is not necessarily a an accurate stand-in for the topic of risk. And that needs to be assessed separately. 
Uh, and frankly, state's attorneys and, and the attorney general's office needs to be able to uh, have notice on these things, regardless of crime type, because there might be real risk issues involved uh, that are not made apparent solely by uh, the crime's presence on this list of, of very serious offenses. So all this does is mean that notice will be required uh, for any case where, um, uh, where a person's been committed pursuant to this section. We want to scroll I, on I think down it, to... Yeah, I guess I would add, add to that. Um, this is James Pepper from the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Um, this notice provision that we're talking about um, is, which will be described on the next page, but it, it really, if, you're, if you remember from the page up about the, the current law, um, what Erica was talking about was the way that the statute is written is that uh, when someone's being discharged from the custody, someone who's been found incompetent um, uh, is being discharged from the care and custody of the commissioner um, that, you know, who's committed a crime, um, that they'll provide notice uh, to the state's attorney and uh, at least 10 days prior to that discharge. And, and that, that provision has been whittled down over time through the Supreme Court. Um, of Vermont, which just says that that actually only applies to an initial order. And by the way, the initial order only uh, can last for 90 days. And it doesn't apply when, for instance, an order is expiring. Um, so that so when it, if an order is renewed and then is expiring, the state's attorney will never know. There'll never be any bridge back to um, the either the criminal case or there won't be any information shared with the victim um, uh, about the status of the person. So what the what the next change does, I don't, did the screen share stop for everyone? I, um, yeah. You, you can't see the, you don't see it right now? No, no. it's gone. Oh, huh. That's strange. I have it on my iPad. Um, well, let me try and start fresh, see if that works. Is it back? Yep. yep. We're on page six of 11. Is where right. You, I think it went right back to where you left off, Eric. Oh, okay. So yeah, there was the language that Pepper was just referring to, and then yep. moving on to here. So then what, what this section does, which is now C2, um, which says when a person at least 10 days prior, and then it covers all of the scenarios uh, that have kind of been limited by the Supreme Court. It says when a person's being kind of discharged uh, from the care and the custody, when they're moving down from a secure to a non-secure, um, uh, you know, from an order of kind of secure residential facility to an order of non-hospitalization when they're kind of going through to the community care. So they'll be back in the community. Uh, when an order is expiring or uh, if the person absconds um, from the custody of the commissioner, then there'll be notice provided to the state's attorney and the state's attorney will in turn notify the victim. So this is important one uh, to ensure that victims know when an offender might be back in the community. Um, also, it's important if, if it's a serious crime, for instance, or the person needs, uh, you know, if the person has restored their competency, um, then the SA, the state's attorney can resume the prosecution if, if that's appropriate. I, just so I understand this completely, Eric, um, and, and by the way, this is um, what the network will be testifying against this issue of absconding from custody on line 11. <clears throat> Prior to a Supreme Court decision, the um, state's attorney would receive notice. Is that correct? Was, it, was, it, was that a question for <clears throat> Eric? A uh, question for anybody. Uh, yes, uh, the the original way that the statute was drift, drafted in subsection C just said if someone's being discharged from the care and custody of the commissioner, that the state attorney will receive notice and there'll be a discharge hearing. Um, but that has been modified over time uh, to suggest one in, in one Supreme Court case that that indeterminate period 
that a person could be on one of these orders uh, is actually limited by 90 days. Um, and then two, um, at, w at which point they can, the, the order can be renewed, but that notice provision only applies to the first 90 days. Okay. Uh, and then secondly, if an order is expiring, as in the, the uh, Department of Correct or the Department of Mental Health is not seeking to renew the order, then that's not a discharge for the, for purposes of the statute, and so the, the, those notice provisions fall fall off. So this is restoring kind of what the original intent of the section was, at least uh, what we consider the original intent, which is that the state's attorney, if someone is being released or downgraded or uh, discharged or the term is expiring, essentially if they've res been restored, uh, their competency has been restored, then both the victim and the state's attorney should be notified. Okay. Um, I think, Eric, if you could scroll down a little bit more to, uh, yeah, so, so subsection three, so this is the part um, that Erica and, and uh, Ms. Carroll were, were discussing, which is essentially when someone is not complying with one of the orders um, or that an alternative treatment has not been adequate to meet the treatment needs, then both the court and the state's attorney shall be notified by the commissioner. So this is just, you know, a lot of a lot of the orders of non-hospitalization or of non-hospitalization require somewhat voluntary compliance to show up to the designated agency to take the medications. And so this is a provision that would say that if someone is not showing up to the designated agency or not complying with the, the terms of the order, that, that, the, that the court um, will be notified and the state will be notified. Um, and Again, what Erica described is we're not sure what the next step is, but at least it will trigger a reevaluation of this of the situation. Um, Senator Benning, but at first I want Eric, would you let Judge Gerson know of this change so that he can comment on it the next when we go to markup? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Senator Benning. Uh, James, I'm not sure if this is necessarily just for you, so I hope Eric is also listening and David share as well. The notice provision here, I'm not sure how it dovetails or if it is impacted by HIPAA at all, but I'm assuming the intent is if the state is provided notice that the state in turn would have the ability to notify the victim's family, or at least that would be uh, understood by this, but we don't say that here. Is that something you're anticipating should happen? And if we don't have something here that authorizes that to happen, is there some interference with HIPAA? It's, it's interesting because this section above uh, related to notice specifically spells out that the state's attorney shall notify the victim and we do not have that here. So I, That's I'm, why I'm not I sure. Yeah, right. that's why I asked it. Um, I would probably want to just, I, I know she's not here, but Katie uh, McClinn, Le Legislative Council, was the one that kind of was walking through some of our HIPAA concerns with some of these provisions. And um, so maybe uh, some of the other witnesses would know whether or not this is the type of information that could be shared with a victim. Well, why don't we pose that question for Katie? Um, Eric, if you could make a note of that. Yeah, I can also preliminarily say that I've also looked at some of the HIPAA exceptions for disclosures and uh, sort of a, a rough paraphrase, but there is an exception in HIPAA for, for disclosures that are required to be made by state law. So it can't be, it can't be discretionary. It can't be an authorization for information to be provided. It has to be mandatory provision of information. And if the state law requires that provision, then there is an exception under HIPAA for that. So that's some well, background for, I'll also follow up with Katie, but. Yeah, Eric, if, if the expectation of the state is that they should be sharing this with the victim, it probably ought to mirror the language above that uh, specifically stated that. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, if that's the if that's the direction the committee wants to go, I think you're exactly right, Senator Benning. It should be should be parallel there. Okay. Um, that brings us to. Are there any other questions about section three? That brings us to section four, where I don't think there's any changes. Yes, that's right, Senator Sears. I don't, I don't think there's any other changes at the moment. And section five is the assessment of mental health services and corrections. Section six is the forensic working group. Um, is there a place here for someone like Kelly in the forensic working group? And if not, should we make sure there is? Uh, I'll be honest, this section really is Katie's section, so I'm not okay. familiar with the details. Um, it, so it can, if, if you, this is Jeanette, I'm reading it. It says a working group of interested stakeholders, including as appropriate, but in, it doesn't say exclusive to these members. So I would think that, that it could. Well, I'd say and any the, other interested party permitted victims or families of victims would be i don't know how you put it but that would be i think helpful to to put in there clearly and do they get paid if they're none usually we do that i think we should probably do that here that little line yes we should i mean it's not going to be expensive but they should at least get the and yeah. And the uh, um, expenses, assuming they're traveling. Um, right. So add the per diem boilerplate. Yeah. 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 For those that are not, you know, the usual mm -hmm. language. Yeah. All right. Um, are there any questions for Pepper or David? I want to thank all four of you. Uh, one of you's not here, which is Attorney General Donovan, for the quick turnaround of this um, from the time that Eric and I, um, along with Kelly, began the conversation. It's really good. Uh, our next witness is um, Sarah Robinson. Um, Shall I leave the, the, the statute up, Senator Sears? I, I don't think you need to. Uh, okay. I think it, her, the issue is victim notification when somebody... Ex there is a, a letter from um, on our uh, webpage from um, uh, Deborah Bookfield, um, who uh, Sarah uh, will talk a little bit about. Or is it Karen? Where's Sarah? Is Sarah with us? Yes, she is. Well, she's muted and not. She's presently muted. No. Sarah, can you unmute yourself? She can hear us. She can hear us. There's a letter from Deborah Bookfield, who's a rape victim. Um, who was raped in uh, 1989. Sarah may have just stepped away for a moment and can't no, hear us. Okay, that's possible. Sounds like that's what happened. Um, well, I guess we could go to um, Jack McCullough um, from Vermont Legal Aid and uh, come back to Sarah when she's with us. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you for having me here. Um, can, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I've been... Uh, 
the director of the Mental Health Law Project of Vermont Legal Aid since about 1994, 1995. We represent uh, everybody across the state in environment, in uh, involuntary mental health proceedings um, in the family division of the Superior Court, everywhere in the state um, in civil proceedings. We do not at this point represent uh, defendants in hospitalization or other involuntary mental health proceedings in uh, criminal proceedings. The uh, main <clears throat> reason that we're interested in this bill is in section 2B on, on page three of the bill. And this uh, provision comes out of uh, the work of uh, a working group the legislature uh, created back in 2018 for relating to the um, treatment of people of criminal defendants who have uh, mental health diagnoses. And one of the recommendations of the working group was that uh, or this addresses a situation when a person is either found incompetent to stand trial in the uh, in the criminal case they're charged in, or they've uh, been found uh, not guilty by reason of insanity. And the next step in the process under either of those situations is the court holds a hospitalization hearing. And that is a hearing to determine whether the person uh, will be required to uh, receive involuntary mental health treatment either in a psychiatric hospital or in uh, some other setting pursuant to an order of non-hospitalization. And one of the things that became clear is that uh, in those cases, the, <clears throat> the hearings, the way they are now, the defendant is represented by whoever the defense attorney is, the, uh, the public defender or the um, or retained counsel the state is represented by the state's attorney's office and the disposition of the hospitalization hearing really depends on the, as much as anything, on the knowledge and expertise uh, relating to the um, mental health system. And, uh, and so it was broadly recognized that the best way to provide the representation and provide and manage these hearings is for once there's a determination and the person is going to be uh, potentially hospitalized that uh, someone from my office, since all we do is involuntary mental health proceedings, would be the more appropriate person to represent the defendant. And similarly, the Department of Mental Health or an attorney from the Department of Mental Health would be the uh, appropriate entity to uh, present the arguments relating to hospitalization on the side of the state. Um, so we support the inclusion of uh, subsection 3B or 2B in this legislation. We've been I mentioned to my wife last night I was when I was going to be doing this that I've been working on trying to get this through for for years and I appreciate the uh, the chair's uh, commitment to keep uh, working on this. One thing I should mention, and I don't think it requires a change in language, but I should bring it up. Uh, last year when we were working on this bill, there was uh, some discussion about whether. <clears throat> This provision was going to apply only to people found incompetent or not guilty because of a mental illness or whether it would also relate to people found incompetent uh, because of a developmental disability or uh, intellectual disability. Um, and I've discussed that with the, with Nancy Bryden, who's the director of the Disability Law Project at Vermont Legal Aid, and, and they represent people in uh, the cases that the members of the committee might be aware of under, I think they're called uh, Act 64 proceedings. 
And what, what we both agreed is that it's not necessary to make these, this provision apply to intellectual disability cases, just mental illness cases. And I think that uh, we, it's good the way the language of the, stat, the bill is drafted is probably good enough, but uh, I just want to flag that to see if, if Eric or any other members of the committee think that that should be uh, addressed before it, uh, before it goes to markup. And then <clears throat> I think the last thing I should mention is that uh, there, there will, of course, it, it will, of course, not be possible for uh, my project to handle these cases without, uh, without additional staffing. And so there would be, there'll be a need for, uh, for a fiscal review uh, for this provision. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Senator White. Jack, you said that um, in the bill, it doesn't talk about um, intellectual disability or developmental disability, but um, so you don't think it's necessary to put that in here. It was just, a, you were just raising the question? Exactly. Okay. And who was it that um, you spoke with that said that it didn't need to be addressed here? Uh, Nancy Bryden, the director of our disability law project. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Other questions for Jack? Jack, thank you very much. Appreciate it. You're you welcome. Thanks for having me. Um, did, were you say I, I should ask this. I hate to ask this question. Are you suggesting that who would do the fiscal review? Um, Joint fiscal, or are you suggesting that you have some expertise within not legal aid. No, I think it, I think it would go to joint fiscal. The last time, you know, a few years ago, this was uh, this was in the legislature. There was a fiscal review and a fiscal note uh, issued, and I would certainly be willing to consult with joint fiscal as they're doing that. Okay. Thank you, um, sure. Eric. Do you want to just send a note to Stephanie Barrett to look at this? Yes, I, I can. Yeah. Thank you. Jack, would you by any chance have that note that was done? If a fiscal note had been done a couple of years ago, would you still be able to obtain a copy? I can try. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll look and see what I can find. Um, I'm using the excuse that all my documents are in the Hillier. Well, yeah. <laughs> That's part I, of the problem. It really is part of the problem for me, but I... I I have access to our network even even from home, so I'm I'm optimistic. Okay, great, thank, thank you, Jack. Now let's uh, pivot back to Sarah Robinson, if we could, and um, the letter um, this, uh, is on our uh, website. Yes, uh, thank you all. Um, Apolo from apologies. Deborah Brookfield, Sarah, that's fine. We all do that on Zoom. This is a Zoom trouble. Right. Exactly. Good morning. For the record, Sarah Robinson, Deputy Director at the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. Um, and I'll be brief, but I did want to highlight one small but meaningful change in the draft that you all are discussing today. And thank you, Senator Sears, um, for taking this testimony and also for noting the letter from Deborah Brookfield, which has been posted to the committee's website. I just wanted um, to say that we're broadly supportive of the bill, especially the provisions uh, referencing victim notification. And for many years, as you all know, the state has worked to refine and improve the process for notifying victims through court proceedings and during periods when individuals are um, incarcerated under the custody of the Department of Corrections or on community supervision. However, as State's Attorney Marthage and others highlighted, this victim notification process has, has not worked well after 90 days in cases where individuals are in the custody of the Department of Mental Health, such as um, those that you've heard about today. 
So the small piece I wanted to speak to specifically is related to individuals absconding from the custody of the Commissioner of Mental Health. And so that can be found on page six, lines 15 and 16 in the draft you are looking at. Um, and in the letter that the committee received from Deborah Bookfield, uh, she really outlines her stories. And in essence, when an individual absconds from the custody of the Commissioner of Mental Health, there is not notification for a victim, as there would be if an individual absconded from Department of Corrections custody. And Ms. Brookfield was not notified that the person who had violently assaulted her and threatened her life had absconded from the Department of Mental Health custody, had hitchhiked halfway across the state, um, and was ultimately apprehended just a, a mile from her home. And the way that she found out um, about this series of events is because the Vermont State Police uh, put out a bulletin, a missing persons bulletin for this individual, um, which truly just happened to be seen by her victim's advocate. So her victim's advocate at the Department of Corrections um, was not uh, notified, nor was the state's attorney, nor was obviously Ms. Brookfield. Um, so this is a, it's a small change of those that you're contemplating today, but a very meaningful one. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have about it. Are there any questions for Sarah? Senator White. I just want, thanks, Sarah. I just want to be clear. You're actually supporting the language that's the, in the new draft. Very much so. Okay, great. Thanks. That's what I thought. It was actually her language that was okay. inserted there that had, hadn't been placed in by earlier um, by uh, David Schur or um, James Pepper. Uh, okay. No. No further questions. Thank you very much, Sarah. Appreciate it. Thank um, you. Morning, Fox and Karen Barber. Do you want to comment on behalf of the Department of Mental Health? Yes, uh, thank either you. one of you or both. Yeah. I think we'll do as uh, I think this committee has gotten used to a little tag team um, between the two of us. Um, I'd like to start uh, for the record. Uh, Morning, Fox, Deputy Commissioner for the Department of Mental Health. Uh, I'd like to begin by saying, uh, expressing my thanks to, uh, to you, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Sears, for your comment earlier in the, in the testimony, reminding uh, members of this committee, as well as those of the viewing public, that uh, the vast majority of people with mental illnesses uh, are not uh, the perpetrators of uh, violent acts, uh, and in fact are uh, at greater risk of being on the uh, receiving end. Uh, of, uh, of violent and assaultive uh, acts. And so I just wanted to start by saying thank you for, for that reminder. Um, I also would like to uh, thank Ms. Carroll for her testimony. Uh, I, the, the experiences that she and her family have gone through, uh, no one should ever uh, have, have to uh, even imagine, let alone actually go through. Um, and as Ms. Carroll mentioned, uh, around support for notifications uh, regard, you know, that are uh, described in this bill, prior to the changes uh, that uh, the state's attorneys and, uh, and the attorney generals worked on, the department was in full support of uh, the notifications as it was listed earlier uh, with the uh, listed crimes. Uh, uh, with the expansion of that, I think it does bring some concerns uh, to the department. Uh, and uh, um, I will be asking uh, Karen Barber to speak a little bit more in detail about that. But I just wanted to express that the, the change from notification from listed crimes to any crime uh, is, is a bit concerning, the, the, the sheer volume uh, that that could be and other implications uh, could be rather significant. Uh, and I also believe that uh, it would probably uh, be wise to hear from uh, Vermont Care Partners uh, as to how this would impact their work with uh, criminal court involved folks who uh, end up on orders of non-hospitalization uh, into the community. Um, I would also uh, like to just mention Again, uh, as Ms. Carroll mentioned, uh, the Psychiatric uh, Security Review Board uh, 
Uh, one example being the, the Connecticut model is something the department has been uh, in support of exploring for use in our state. Uh, and uh, so the forensic study group, I, I believe is incredibly important. And I believe that members of this committee have heard me uh, testify for several years now uh, of the uh, somewhat untenable position that the department gets placed in um, in regards to people being committed uh, through the criminal court system uh, and for the lack of uh, a forensic facility in our state uh, and our ability to uh, have people who are criminally justice involved uh, remain in a secure setting. Uh, since the, the flood of the Vermont State Hospital uh, and the rebuilding of the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital and its replacement, all of our hospitals in this state are uh, acute care hospitals, CMS certified, Joint Commission certified. And in order to continue to receive the federal participation and funding that, that funds the vast majority of our psychiatric uh, hospitals, uh, they cannot be used for public safety. And so that therein lies the rub that, that we struggle with in that when a, a person's mental health uh, uh, concerns or issues have been adequately treated that they no longer uh, require hospitalization for a psychiatric uh, treatment. As uh, uh, State's Attorney Marthage mentioned, the, the public safety piece, our focus is to treat the individual and we lose or face losing parts or all of our federal funding if we then restrict and keep people either hospitalized or even kept in a secure residential setting uh, solely for a public uh, safety uh, perspective. There are public safety connections between mental health and law enforcement, that's clear. Uh, however, uh, the, 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 the piece that we really need to look at is um, what type of facility are, are we in need of? Uh, and I think it's also important, I think, you know, Ms. Carroll made a, a great point as well around people with substance abuse um, and substance use disorders. Uh, and I would add in developmental and intellectual uh, disabilities as well, uh, that because those systems have no uh, uh, involuntary uh, inpatient, if you will, uh, or secure settings, uh, whenever there's a the comorbid connection uh, or the dual connection of mental health and addictions, mental health and uh, developmental intellectual disabilities or uh, traumatic brain injuries, et cetera. Really the only recourse that the courts are really looking at is to place them into the custody of the, of the Department of Mental Health, uh, which is not necessarily the best uh, services for those individuals. Uh, and again, quickly look at, does that individual need uh, psychiatric care? And once that their psychiatric uh, uh, issues have been treated, then what? And so uh, I will kind of end end with that. But you know, I think the the, the piece that I I want to stress is that we really need to look at and really study and figure out what is going to work for Vermont um, and, and such like that. Um, but uh, lack of 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 those types of resources we're going to be stuck in this position on an ongoing basis. Um, and uh, I'll leave it at that uh, for now, but uh, I'll ask uh, Karen Barber to go into a little bit more detail on some of the specifics. Uh, but just to remind folks, we're in support and we really truly believe that we would like people to have notification uh, when some of the individuals are being discharged uh, from a secure setting. Uh, that's why we were in support of the original language uh, of, of S3 with the listed crimes. Uh, and so I just wanna make sure that we understand that, but we're, that we do have some serious concerns of expanding it to any crime and, and what that impact could be. Um, I guess, I, I want to make sure I understand that. One of the frustrations um, that I heard was um, that 
cases are different in different counties. So in Rutland County, somebody who's off their medications, the Rutland County Mental Health gets a call. They send out a team to talk to the person, uh, get them back on their medication. In Bennington County, that doesn't happen. And, and this committee has worked tirelessly on issues of geographical justice. Um, seems to me like, why doesn't that happen in Bennington County? Um, I guess those are my questions. That's one question. Um, understand your concern about the uh, about all of this, um, you know, in terms of the, the cost. But um, and if you're not responsible for public safety, who is? Uh, it starts in 20 with this gentleman, or the alleged perpetrator of the crime that we talked about, Darren Pronto. He's charged with false information to police in February of 2015, sent to a record of A few months later, he's charged with domestic assault, placed on probation with mental health conditions. Supposed to be working with UCS. UCS does not share information with the state's attorney. And within months, he's violated his probation, brought back to court, given stricter probation conditions, again, focused on mental health. A year later, he violates his probation. Again, he's placed on probation with mental health conditions, requiring him to work with the designated mental health agency, UCS. He again, violate, violates again within a month, and now his defense attorneys start to argue competency. During 2018, he's admitted to the state hospital and DMH has entered in as a party to the criminal proceedings. State's attorney's office does not receive any information from DF DMH. In fact, we're told we're not entitled to the information. Defendant is now found not competent, requests hospitalization hearing, DMH you know, intervenes. This is all two years before the murder. Um, and so I guess what I'm trying to get at two things. Why don't we have a similar response in Bennington County that we have in Rutland County? And number two is, if we only look at listed crimes, then we would never see these other crimes that were committed um, by this person um, and might have been able to uh, catch this before it ended up in a murder. But, can I uh, can I follow up? Yeah, sure. Can I follow up on that? Um, I'm uh, I got think I got a little confused here because we're was he um can was he determined to be incompetent to stand trial or um, innocent by or not guilty by reason of insanity in those earlier things? Because if it. it I think I got a little confused here because if we're talking about, um, there are a lot of people on ONHs me, that, um, I, the, the, let me, can I finish? Well, I was gonna answer your question. Go oh, okay. Well, cause there are a lot of people on ONHs that aren't in the criminal system. And are we talking about notifying pay, victims whenever someone is released from an ONH, or are we talking about it only if they are in these two criminal uh, system I'm categories? Talking, I'm talking about this individual. During 2018, he admitted to the state, was admitted to the state hospital. DMH has entered as the party of the criminal proceeding. State attorney's office does not receive any information. From DMH. In fact, we're told we're not entitled to the information. Did not tell his victim as to the time, at the time, anything about his whereabouts. Then the defendant is found not competent, and the state attorney's office requests a hospitalization hearing. DMH intervenes as a party. Okay. The senator I, I would like. To, I think that's you know. If if you'd like, I'll try to answer. Yeah. Please. Your questions. Uh, Is that clear, the, Senator White? I mean, I'm, yeah, yeah. I, I just didn't know if the two years leading up to that, if he had, he had not been, been until then, until right. 2018. Started in right. 2015. Right. There were three years, and then he 
then they right, found but, him not competent. But he wasn't in one of those categories of incompetent or criminally insane before that. No, it was three years okay. later. Right. Um, okay. So in Thanks. regards to the first question, why are things different maybe at United Counseling Service versus Rutland Mental Health Service? Um, designated agencies historically have uh, designed their programs uh, independent of one another uh, in order to meet the needs of their local communities. Uh, and so what typically works in uh, Orleans County may not work in Rutland County, which may not work in Washington County. Uh, and so the specific of an outreach team like that um, may, may be different. It, it, there could be a lot of various reasons why that played out that way. Uh, but the, historically, that's part of the reason why the services are, are somewhat different. There are particular t types of services through contracts and grants through the state, uh, through our funding that they're required to, to provide. And those are of a consistent nature. Uh, as far as you know, the, the basic CRT services, emergency services, uh, things of that nature. Uh, but uh, how they implement different pieces of, of the service arrays that they have are going to vary based on their regions. Um, and unfortunately, as far as the, the case that, that people are talking about, being, a mental, being part of the mental health system and being uh, a mental health provider myself, I can't really go into the details in my knowledge of uh, the history and, and treatment. Uh, let, me, let me, I understand that. Let me make clear. I was raising that in response to you saying that you didn't want to deal with every crime. You just wanted to mm -hmm. stick to listing crimes. Well, and I, and I, I was showing my... a three-year history there of lesser crimes. Right. Until and I he guess... found not competent. And then the, you know, that was in 2018 and 2021 he murders or hasn't been found yet. So the that, weight of evidence is great, but he, he um, is accused of murdering uh, Miss Carroll's uh, daughter. And, and I appreciate that. I guess part of my concern, I'll 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 stop in a second and let. Well, I wasn't uh, I wasn't trying to get information about that particular well, case. I, I Rather understand. using that as an example of where the. I don't think he was right. accused of listed crimes. I guess part of my concern, uh, Senator, and I'll let, again, I'll let uh, Karen Barber uh, kind of flesh this out a bit more, is we have someone who is uh, uh, committed based on uh, uh, an order of hospitalization or an order of non-hospitalization based off of a criminal offense of uh, unlawful trespass. Um, and part of the, the finalization uh, and re resolution of the case is that the charges are dismissed uh, and they are placed on order of non-hospitalization. And my concern would be is that individuals like that, now as the ONH is being resolved, that we, we notify state's attorneys that uh, the ONH is not going to be renewed or that we're going to terminate or something of that sort, that they then will seek an order of hospitalization or contest that discharge, uh, and how free, and I and I guess would that would that have have helped us three years down the line? Uh, and you know, I think that we start getting some concerns when we have uh, folks who may be in the hospital or in a secure setting, and we have the courts making the final decision <clears throat> as to whether or not uh, a person needs to remain in a certain treatment place. Um, but I, I really would like uh, Karen Barber to kind of finish up some of those thoughts. Senator Benning has a question or comment. Yeah, I, I, I look at this as a victim's protection bill. So morning, uh, for me, the, the Pronto matter is a no brainer. But let me flip it to the opposite end of the spectrum for a moment. I've got a local grocery store here. It's called the White's Market. White's Market has uh, frequent occurrences where somebody comes in shoplifting and the shoplifter may be uh, a repeat customer um, and all of a sudden you've got a question of mental health and the individual 
uh, is given an ONH and the White's market agrees uh, they're going to simply let the charges go because the person is helped. But don't they also have a right to know ahead of time um, to be able to watch out for this individual that may be coming back into the store to repeat the offense? And if they went to corrections and there was no mental health, do they have the right to know that they're coming out of corrections? Well, if they're coming out of corrections, they would have been either as a result of a plea agreement or a conviction in a trial been given a sentence that the victim would be aware of and would have some understanding of when they're supposed to be released. We're working on that actually in another bill. But um, to me, this is a victim's protection law. And, and when I hear you saying you're concerned about expanding, um, I almost have to react and say, it's that's not the point. The point is that people have a right to be reconnected with this system and knowing ahead of time who's going to be a threat to them if they've been a threat in the past or who potentially could be. So I, I guess I, I'm not sharing as much of a concern as you're expressing here and Karen may have statistics or whatever to back up why that may be an additional problem for your office. Um, but I, I can't really wrap my head around why we would have to limit it to a specific list of crimes, because this is not for the benefit of the person who's going into a hospitalization order. This is actually a bill for reconnecting the victims, as I understand it, to the no. process. Can I follow up on that, Senator Sears? Uh, Before I don't know if Morning Flux wants to respond or, first. Or, or for Karen, just yeah. to okay. clarify what Joe said. So in the, in the case that you were talking about, the person is a shoplifter and they're going in and they're put, they might be put on an order of non-hospitalization, but have they been actually um, declared incompetent to stand trial or um, not guilty by reason of insanity? Because those are the two, the two things that we're talking about here. If you, if you required, um, every single person who moves off an ONH that has nothing to do with those two circumstances to, for people to be notified, that's, go, that's going way beyond what this bill was intended to be, which is those two categories of people, it is from what I understand, because the shoplifter probably was not declared incompetent nor in a, um, not guilty by reason of insanity. So I think that's where we're getting confused here because we're talking about only these two circumstances, I believe. Yeah. Am I, I might be totally wrong here. No, I think you're actually right. I hate to admit that. <laughs> I know you do, but thank you for it. it. It's when somebody has been declared either not yes. competent to stand trial or not guilty by reason. Right. And I doubt on a shoplifting charge. Right, I don't think so. But Karen, did you want to comment? Or Sorry, I was, no worries, thank you. Uh, for the record, Karen Barber, General Counsel of the Department of Mental Health. Um, and so I have um, some comments, but I think uh, Senator White, you touched on, I think one of the department's big concerns and what um, Deputy Commissioner Fox is talking about, the way their language reads now is you omitted the section where it said it only applies to people that have been not competent or found uh, guilty by not reason or uh, not guilty by reason of insanity. So the language as now, which was very concerning to us, is you opened it up to everyone. And so it would have applied mm -hmm. to that shoplifting case. If that wasn't the intent of the committee, then um, I think that that really, I think, tailors some of our concerns because that was one of my big concerns is you really opened it up to a huge group of people. Did you wanna say something, Eric? All right. I'll wait, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna note it for Senator Sears that I wanted to respond to that because that certainly wasn't the intent. I, I don't see that no. in the language, but no, I think it was intentionally intent. crafted to not do that. Right, and the, the language, is, I, the whole bill is based upon Though, in my view, those that are found um, <clears throat> um, not competent to stand trial 
or um, not guilty by reason of insanity. Great. And I think. Uh, and, and, and one of the things that um, we don't have in this bill, but hopefully the discussion has ensued, I've been working with Erica Mafta, John, and a couple of other people, is there are, uh, you know, the effort to divert many of these cases to um, the local mental health center or whatever to try to deal with the or court cases, so you know, that that's a major part of uh, let's solve the problems. Um, yeah, and so I think kind of as a preface, you know, we just received kind of a forwarded copy of this yesterday afternoon. So, you know, unfortunately, the department wasn't involved in these conversations, and so maybe some of my questions and concerns. Um, are just because it, we weren't part of that. And so I hadn't seen the bill before. And so I'm kind of wading through and trying to understand the legal implications. So, you know, we have comments, but certainly we could use some more time to really think about them. Um, and it would be helpful, I guess, maybe if I could talk to Eric and Katie about some of my concerns. Um, you know, I think this is a tough position for DMH to be in because, you know, obviously my heart goes out to Mrs. Kelly as, as a mother, I can't imagine. I think my job though is to kind of look at it as the legal implications and what does that mean for the department and the department is bound by federal and state laws and regulations, which is what I'm kind of looking at when I'm going through this. Um, I think one of the concerns I had about the broadened group, and it sounds like it's narrowed a little bit, but I, I still have some concerns about it because it is quite a bit broader than we had talked about before, is from a HIPAA perspective. You know, um, DMH is a covered entity. We are required to comply with HIPAA, which is a federal yes. regulation. And while there is a provision in there that um, if it's required by, by state law, but um, I'm not sure that's a free for all where we can just kind of say, that, that, that a state can pass any sort of law and that HIPAA is okay with that. So I really need time to do some research and understand the implications of the new version that we just got yesterday to understand where that okay, um, works but with our HIPAA I, guidelines. I don't have, uh, I, I think it's, maybe I'm oversimplifying things, but I think it's pretty simple concept. concept. If the courts have found somebody to be uh, not competent to stand trial, or not guilty by reason of insanity, <clears throat> and the state has gone all the way to, to that process, do victims have some right to know what's happened? Um, and I, it goes back to Senator Benning's comments. We're narrowing it to that group. I believe that the intent of, and I don't see David Scherer or James Pepper here for Erica Matthews still, but I believe you know, it was never our intent to go to people who might have been diverted, even, you know, sent to diversion and, um, you know, go to the local mental health center for counseling. I don't think our attempt is to get to that. Group. Never been my intent. Senator but, White. So I'm sorry to um, talk so much here, but I, I think that um, when I, when that new section is under the um, section three, it's under findings and order persons with mental illness. That section doesn't talk at all about persons who are um, deemed incompetent to stand trial or found not guilty because of reason of insanity. It's just anybody who ha is, ha is put under the um, jurisdiction of the commissioner of mental health, either hospitalization or none. So my, I think that in the rewriting here, I think that I don't, I can't see it now, but I think that part of that first paragraph that was in the original one was left off that says it only addresses those two reasons. And I think that was left off. So the way it reads now, Eric, I think, but Eric, I can't see can, it, so I'm not sure. Eric, go ahead, Eric. Yeah. So. Senator White, that section 4822 is lodged in Title 13 only. It only applies to the criminal proceedings having to do with persons found not guilty by reason of insanity or incompetent to stand trial. It doesn't It's not in Title 18. It has nothing to do with the civil commitments for other persons. So I, I, I'm, I'm sure that if you hear the other attorneys who practice in this area like Jack and Karen, they'll, they'll agree with that. And that if you look at the language on the new language on page six, 
that is these new provisions about victim notification it specifically says when a person has been committed under this okay. section so it's it's very specifically tied to only only you know because there's two as you're pointing out there's sort of two ways a person can can become subject to dmh custody through the criminal system and through a, a civil proceeding this only applies to the folks that come in through the criminal system after a, a incompetency or or uh, insanity at the time of the offense finding. And I think Eric, Eric, I just want to add that if you go back to page two, um, specifically line eleven, this entire section is premised upon an individual who has been charged on information, complaint, or indictment with a criminal offense. So I'm I'm only hearing it from a criminal proceeding, not from a civil proceeding. Yes, that's correct. Does that help any? Um, so again, previously, and when I had talked to Katie about is there case law out there that kind of allows this kind of HIPAA exception, we were talking about a narrow set of crimes, really egregious crimes. Um, elopement is a new factor in there. So again, I just need time to go back and look. You know, again, I just got this yesterday, so I haven't had the time to really review the HIPAA implications. But How the much department time do you needs need? to make sure. Um, I'm not sure because I think there are a couple other issues. I'm sure if we could get a group together, I think it, you know it's helpful when the department is at the table when these conversations happen, just so that we can kind of ask these questions in advance. But uh, you know, if we could pull a group together later this week, I think that would be helpful. Well, this is Wednesday. Crossovers Friday. And because I think when I get into the the O and H issues, I think we also really need to make sure the designated agencies are at the table. And it also. Oh implicates HIPAA issues, but I think one of the things that this ONH provision is doing is a couple things, right? It's taking away clinical decision making from the from the DAs. Um, you know, often with these criminal ONHs, there's lots of provisions in there, many that don't tie to mental health, but are more like you can't go within a certain amount of this person or you can't drink because they're coming out of a criminal court. That's not really tied to mental health treatment. And there are certainly times where someone isn't complying with the exact letter of their ONH, but there's a clinical decision made that that doesn't justify the revocation. But instead, the clinical team is going to work with that person and they're going to continue. You know, the department's goal is to have non-coercive treatment in the community. And so what this provision is doing is really flipping that on its head and it's making the department and the DAs really more of a probation and parole function. It's taking away our ability to make clinical decisions. And it's also saying, well, okay, what's the other step? The step is to re-hospitalize people. And it goes back to the, the problem with that. If someone doesn't meet clinical criteria, we can't hospitalize them and use Medicaid funding, right? Because as, as Deputy Commissioner Fox pointed out, we only have Medicaid funded hospitals. So we would be violating the conditions of our certification and accreditation and our Medicaid funding if we're admitting folks, if we're required to admit folks that don't meet this level of care. But, and that's but, kind of what this is doing. And so from a legal perspective, I think we have a lot of concerns about what this would practically mean and how this would work. Okay. I, I have a lot of concerns about people being endangered by folks who are not being treated in the community, but are in the community. And folks who are coming out um, and the victims aren't even notified. And there's no knowledge from the victim the victim even be on the lookout. I, I have a great concern about what's happening. And I think that part of the obligation, um, not asking the Department of Mental Health to become the Department of Corrections, but you have a forensic population that this state has not dealt with. And it, we keep hearing excuses why it can't be dealt with. And I think we've been talking about this for a long time. Um, and I, I, that's who we're talking about. It's a forensic population. Again, small population. But um, when we hear that we can't protect communities, and I read in the newspaper that state police officers who were shot at feel that um, the sentence that somebody received this morning or yesterday afternoon 
um, time served in two years because the state's attorney was afraid that they were going to be found not competent to stand trial or not, not guilty by reason of insanity at the time of the shootings of state police at state police officers. It concerns me. It concerns from honors. And, you know, that that's really, I, I, um, anyway, um, I, I would like to um, proceed with this tomorrow morning, um, but I realize that you feel like you need more time. And that's a great way to operate a business here. Um, um, but um, we'll take it up can Friday ask, morning at 8.30. Um, can we'll I ask one more question? Up. Yeah, I've got a few other. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Senator. I, I just, I <laughs> realize that this only deals with um, uh, insanity and incompetency, but, and uh, maybe I read this entirely wrong, but on section 4822, it says, if the court finds that a person is in need of treatment or a patient in need of further treatment as defined in 18 BSA 7101, and I think that's the section that says that they are a danger to themselves or others, and they need to be on um, an ONH or a hospitalization order. And so if that, if we're talking about all of those people here, then we are broadly expanding it. We're not just talking about, and I may be reading this wrong, but I thought that was the section that talks about um, defining a person who needs, who isn't necessarily involved in the criminal system, but is, is defined under there. So I, I, I might be entirely confused, but I, I do see the department's um, concern that this is opening it up to everybody who's on a DNH or an order of hospitalization. I could just respond there. It, it, it doesn't do that. Um, okay. The, the, that, that statute sits in chapter 157 of title 13. It's only a reference to people that are coming in through this criminal proceedings. As Senator Benning mentioned, it flows from the previous statutes. It's not referring to any of the, the civil proceedings under Title 18. That's the broader universe of folks that you're talking about, Senator White. I okay. saw Jack stand up as well. I, I think he probably okay. could explain it better than I could. But, but no, that make I understand uh, now. Uh, Thank uh, you. Uh, I'd like to give time before we take a break to Kelly Carroll for a brief comment or question. Kelly was our earlier witness. My battery running low. Kelly, are you there? All right, well, why don't we? Sorry, I wasn't able to unmute. My apologies. Oh, um, okay. Just wanted yeah. to um, yeah, comment on something that, that Mr. Fox said. Um, I truly believe that this a whole issue takes a multidisciplinary um, approach. And um, I just wanted to let everybody know that on Monday afternoon, I had a call with um, AHS Secretary um, Mike Smith and um, DMH Commissioner Sarah Squirrel, Commissioner of Corrections James Baker, and Chief Prevention Officer Monica Hutt. And Senator Sears, you had asked um, Mr. Fox, what was the difference between UCS and um, Rutland's Department of Mental Health and, and some of the services. And one of the things that we had talked about, most notably Commissioner Squirrel and I, was about contractor compliance. And I think that that's a big opportunity when you look at you know, what some of the differences are. Personally, I'm a food management contractor and if we don't do what my clients say, we're out. And um, sometimes we hear, uh, it's the only game in town, they're really nice people. But I just wanted to add that, um, you know, I support um, having you know, people with mental illness out in the community if they're not violent. I think we have a lot of wonderfully productive people in the community that, that do have um, mental health challenges that they deal with and, and they're completely productive. And um, I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew I'm not advocating for um, them to be locked up, but contractor compliance, I think is a big issue with some of the differences and the lack of it. And I just wanted to express that. And again, thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad to know that 
that the secretary and, and the commissioners met with you and uh, that mm -hmm. uh, hopefully was helpful in understanding some of the challenges. I want to be part of the, the solution. Faces. Thank you. Uh, Jack McCullough, did anybody have a question for Kelly or Common? Jack, go ahead. Thank Briefly. you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to uh, respond to Senator White's question. Um, it's true that uh, these sections in Title 13, 4820 and 4822 do make reference to the uh, mental health provisions <coughs> of Title 18, particularly, I think we were talking about 7101, which is the definition section. But, uh, but the whole point of those, of that reference in Title uh, 18 was to bring in the definitions of the terms mental illness, person in need of treatment, patient in need of further treatment into the consideration for uh, cases that involve uh, not guilty by reason of insanity or incompetent to stand trial. It, as I agree with Eric that the language on, pay, on lines three to four of, uh, of page six provide that uh, the uh, notification provision only applies to someone who has been committed pursuant to 13 VSA section 4822. Um, I, I do agree with, uh, with the comment made by, uh, by the department that this really does broaden possibly, um, possibly too far the number of cases that were involved because uh, Senator White, you mentioned, well, you don't think the person who's uh, the shoplifter would have been found incompetent to stand trial or not guilty by reason of insanity. In fact, under 4822, the only way you get onto an order of hospitalization or an order of non-hospitalization is if you were found not guilty by reason of insanity or uh, incompetent to stand trial. And it applies from everything to uh, disorderly conduct all the way up to homicide charges. So in fact, in my experience, the largest share of people who are found who get into the involuntary mental health system through the criminal process are charged with, uh, with uh, minor and nonviolent uh, offenses. Thank so you. I hope that you're yeah. welcome. Yeah, I, I, I just, who else do we want to hear from on this bill? Um, probably Matt Valerio should be, um, Judge Grierson. Um, and will mental health be ready tomorrow morning or one more? How much time does mental health need? The Department of Mental Health, excuse me. If we could have until Friday, that would be great. Um, I think also we do need to regroup with the, the designated agencies. Um, I think they are someone you should hear from, and I think certainly we're going to need to touch base with them and kind of talk through the implications um, for them because we contract with them to, to provide- Well, let's services. see if we can kill the bill. Let's see. If it needs to be tomorrow morning, I will do my best. No, um, I, let's, um, let me think about this. Uh, can we see if we can hear from Judge Grierson and Matt Valerio tomorrow morning from 8.45 till 9.30? Peggy, um, we'll cancel the miscellaneous judiciary bill, S-97. Yep. And then, um, Scheduled for nine for eight thirty on Friday morning. Um, S three again to hear from mental health, and uh, I don't have time to bring in every designated agency, um, and I don't think we need to. the The issues raised here um, yeah, well, well. You want to bring in the designated agencies, Karen? 
I was just wondering if Vermont Care Partners might have a comment. I don't think you need to bring in all the designated agencies, but okay. Vermont Care all Partners right. could all speak right. for I, them. I, I completely okay. agree. I think if, if uh, uh, okay. Julie Tesler, as the representative from Vermont Care Partners, I don't believe they've even seen this amendment. Um, and so to allow them to at least speak to it, I, I think would be uh, a, a good compromise. I don't think you need to hear from every designated agency. I think they can represent those voices. Okay, well, so we'll, we'll hear from them on um, Friday briefly. Um, and uh, Peggy, we'll work on the agenda in time. Sounds good. After this meeting. Um, so uh, we're going to take a, a brief break, come back to this bill, and um, and then take up S7 at, um, which is the appointment bill, which should be pretty close. Um, we scheduled yeah. 45 uh, I, I'm sorry that we have such little time with this, but I'm also sorry that it took until the other day for um, a rewrite to happen because the first time we heard that we walked through this bill was January 14th. And, you know, I, and I think, you know, we, we expressed that too, you know, just, just learning about this amendment yesterday. In fact, the language that the uh, attorney generals put forward for page three in, in resolving the potential conflict of uh, the AG's office and representing the department, to be honest, that was my suggestion. That was the department's suggestion as far as how to resolve that because we had a collaborative conversation with the attorney general's office. And so I'm sorry that this is mucking up the works and slowing things down right now. And I only wish that we had been a part of this conversation from the beginning when the when the uh, <clears throat> attorney generals and state's attorneys started to work on this. And then it would have been better for us to have come in with a final package for you all today. I'll take responsibility for that. Um, <clears throat> I was trying to get something, I'm trying to juggle 14 different interest groups um, at one time, and it's, I'm not a great juggler. Um, but uh, we do the best we can with what we've got, and meeting over Zoom obviously is not easy, and I'm sorry that the, um, the amendment didn't get to you sooner. Um, but I might also add that um, we will... Um, try to hear from everybody and try to do the best we can with what we have. Um, it's not all I can do. It wasn't directed at trying to exclude anybody. No. Understood. And we all are juggling a million things. And again, we're all trying to do this while we're still in the middle of a pandemic and doing things over Zoom and everything else. So. Um, it's completely understandable. And, you know, same thing I say to, to my staff. We just try to work with everything and try to give everyone grace because uh, it's tough times. All right. So I want to, um, we have S25 to take up tomorrow as well as S30. Um, so those are the, and this bill are the four that are outstanding. Um, so why don't we take a 15 minute break and come back at 11, um, continue to discuss this amendment and other bills and anybody who would like to join us at 11. Um, <clears throat> but particularly um, David, uh, if you can work with DMH as well on, on the amendment, please. We'll be ready to do that. 